I'm going to um, start with a Bible reading, um, reading from the CEV version, so if it's slightly different from what you see on the screen, don't worry too much about it, and it's your choice whether you want to read along or listen along with the reading of the Word. What I'm going to do is pick up the last verse from John chapter 8, and then we're going to move straight into John chapter 9. And of course, I know you know this, but it's worth mentioning, the original manuscripts didn't have chapter headings. They had just been inserted in. So sometimes we lose a little bit of continuity when we're reading from one chapter to another. So it's good to bear that in mind. So at the end of chapter 8, Jesus is busy talking with a crowd who are quite animated and not particularly receptive to what he's saying. And it says this, Jesus answered, I tell you for certain that even before Abraham was, I am. The people picked up stones to kill Jesus, but he hid and left the temple. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who'd been born blind since birth. Jesus' disciples asked, Teacher, why is this man born blind? Was it because he or his parents sinned? No, it wasn't, Jesus answered. But because of his blindness, you will see God work a miracle for him. As long as it's day, we must do what the one who sent me wants me to do. When the night comes, no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And after Jesus said this, he spat on the ground and he made some mud and he smeared it on the man's eyes. And then he said, go and wash off the mud in the Siloam pool. The man went and washed in Siloam, which means one who is set. And when he washed off the mud, he could see. The man's neighbors and the people who had seen him begging wondered if it could be the same man. So them, some of them said, he, it's the same beggar, and while others said, well, it looks like him. But he told them, I'm the man. Then how can you see, they asked. He answered, somebody named Jesus made some mud and smeared it on my eyes. And he told me to go and wash it off in the Siloam pool. And when I did, I could see. Where's he now, they asked. I don't know, he answered. The day when Jesus made the mud and healed the man was a Sabbath. And so the people took the man to the Pharisees. They asked him how he was able to see, and he answered, Jesus made some mud, smeared it on my eyes, and after I washed it off, I could see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man, Jesus, doesn't come from God. If he did, he wouldn't break the law of the Sabbath. And others asked, how could somebody who is a sinner work such a miracle? And since the Pharisees couldn't agree among themselves, they asked the man, what do you say about the one who healed you, your eyes? He's a prophet, the man told them. But the Jewish leaders would not believe that the man had once been blind. So they sent for his parents and asked them, is this the son you said was born blind? How can he now see? The man's parents answered, Well, we're certain that he's our son, and we know he was born blind. But we don't know how he got his sight or who gave it to him. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. The man's parents said this because they were afraid of their leaders. The leaders already agreed that no one was having anything to do who said that Jesus was the Messiah. The leaders called the man back and said, Swear by God to tell the truth. We know that Jesus is a sinner. The man replied, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. All I know is I used to be blind, but now I see. What did he do to you? They asked. How did he heal your eyes? The man said, I've already told you once and you refused to listen. Why do you want me to tell you again? Do you also want to become his disciples? The leaders insulted the man and said, You're his follower. We followers of Moses. We are sure that God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where Jesus comes from. How strange, the man replied. 
He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from. We know that God only listens to people who love and obey him. God doesn't listen to sinners. And this is the first time in history that anyone's given sight to somebody born blind. Jesus couldn't do anything unless he came from God. The leaders told the man, you've been a sinner since the day you were born. Do you think you can teach us anything? And then they said, you can never come back into any of our synagogues. When Jesus heard what happened, he went and found the man. And then Jesus asked, do you have faith in the Son of Man? He replied, sir, if you'll tell me who is, is, I'll, I'll put my faith in him. You've already seen him, Jesus answered, and right now he is talking to you. The man said, Lord, I put my faith in you. And then he worshipped Jesus. Jesus told him, I came to judge the people of the world. I am here to give sight to the blind and make blind everybody who can see. When the Pharisees heard Jesus said, they said, are, are we blind? Jesus answered, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. But now you claim to see, you will keep on being guilty. What a brilliant story. <clears throat> it has an uk or an ick value attached to it, doesn't it, really? When I was a kid and I remember reading the story sort of relatively early, I just thought, eh, there's Jesus spitting on the ground. I come from a pit of village. So you will excuse me by saying, there's Jesus hockling on the ground. Do, do, do they still use that word nowadays, hockling? Yeah, okay, fair enough. It's pitmatic, pit village talk. It always, seemed, it always seemed a gross element to the story. As a kid, I was always thinking to myself, couldn't he have done it any other nicer way? Wouldn't it have been better if he just said, you're healed, you know? But spit and mud, dirt and spit, it just seemed such a strange thing. So it, it's only niggled me for decades to the point where I am now, where I really got to the point where I thought, I've got to sort this out. I've got to try and figure out what's going on. Because there's always something going on. Yeah? And here's a little tip. The odder it seems, the more interesting it becomes. Yeah? The odder it seems, the more interesting it really becomes. Now, I suppose any preacher, when they start to get a text, does some simple things. They ask themselves some questions. And they're very good questions to ask. And so I start to think, well, okay, well, when did it take place? Because it's important that we place all the stories of Jesus in the right time frame. Do you understand? Sometimes it's really important to know whether it's just before the crucifixion or whether it's when Jesus is starting out. Because it sometimes changes the nuance of the story. Where did it take place? Why did it happen as it did? And what can we learn from it? So that's what I want to do. I just want to steer us, if you like, through the story. So when did it take place? And I think the timing is really, really interesting because some massive things had just happened. This was at the time of the great feast. And this was the feast of Shabbat. It was the feast of the festival of tabernacles. And if you remember the story, Jesus didn't know at one point whether he was going to go there or not. His brothers wanted him to go. And he had that conversation, said, I don't think I'm going. And then he went in secret. And it's important to get in your mind this festival of booths, what it was about, this Feast of Tabernacles. It celebrated the journey of the Israelites through the wilderness. And so they had nowhere permanent to live. So during this feast, for the seven days of the feast, they lived outside to celebrate and commemorate this journey in the wilderness without proper roofs over their heads. 
And so what they did on the t- rooftops and in streets and everywhere that they could, even on the Mount of Olives, they built booths, tents. Sh- well, not even tents. We hovels that they could live in for a week. They would get palm branches and, and, and they would just sort of prop them up into classic sort of airframes and, and lie branches on top. And they would carry these branches uh, with them as well, these palm leaves. And they would take them and they would bind four different types together. And they would carry them around everywhere during this feast. And on this um, feast, one of the things that they celebrated was the rite of water libation. That sounds good, doesn't it? Well, can you remember, of course, in the wilderness, God provided water for them. That too. You're in the wilderness. 40 years. You're going to get thirsty. Yeah? So God provided water. So they would commemorate this gift of God. And what would happen on the great day of the feast? The shofar trumpet would be blown. And everybody would carry their luyas, which was these uh, branches. And they would wave them in the air. And at that point, the priest carried water to the altar. And on this last great day of the feast, that was a special commemoration of this, the water libation rite reached its climax. The priest would circle the altar seven times round, and they would pour water out with great pomp and ceremony. This was the Hosanna at uh, Rabbah, the great Hoshiana, which is translated as save now. And while they were doing it, Everybody, all the priests that we talked about earlier on who were instructed to sing, must have been a grand choir. But they would start to recite and sing the great Hallels, which was the Psalms from 113 to 118. Can you imagine the noise coming out of this? And then the priests on duty would have to go down to the Pool of Siloam, And in the pool of Siloam, they would fill this uh, golden ewer and they would carry it back up while the Psalms are going on. And at the pinnacle, the absolute high point, the Psalms would stop and they would pour out the water on the altar. Now it's interesting because this is the only quiet moment that there was. And what did Jesus do? At this very moment, when they've sang the Hallels, they've waved their palms in the air, they've poured out the water, it says on the great day of the feast, he stood up. And he cried out with a loud voice, If anyone drinks the water that I will give, he will never thirst again. How to make yourself popular with the Pharisees. No wonder they were trying to kill him in the temple. No wonder they were picking up stones to stone him. Wow. If any man's thirsty. And Jesus talked about living water. Of course, it says that they sent out the temple guards to arrest him. But they came back without him. Now, as far as excuses go, this was a doozy. Can you remember their excuse? They go to arrest Jesus and they come back empty-handed and they say, never a man spoke like this man. In other words, they listen to Jesus. (laughs) We're (laughs) absolutely caught and said, oh, we can't arrest him and went back. Temple guards. The Pharisees said, you mean he's deceived you also? Well, let's explore this living water just for a second because you'll see how important it is. You see, the Jews understood what a living water was. If, if you were in Israel, there was three ways that you could get water. 
the first thing you could do was build a system. This was good and sensible. I don't mean a, the trouble is you think systems now you think if you loo, don't you? I'm not I don't mean they build toilets. But they build tanks. Okay? Well should change the word system to tank. We'll just go through and so they built tanks in the houses and they, they collected water that was coming and from the rain. But of course that water gets stale pretty quick and you've got to make it a very clean tank if you want to have clean water out of it. It's not brilliant, is it? It's better than going thirsty. The second thing you could do is to dig a well. Now I've looked into this because I like the idea of being off-grid. Eco-warrior Dave Taylor. <laughs> Sink a well. You've only got to dig down around about 500 feet. <laughs> through the rock. Paul, if you want a digging job later on, I'll... <laughs> but the most prized water that you could get was water that came from a spring. And that was called living water. So whenever you see living water in the scriptures, it's talking about gushing out from a spring. So let's get back to the story, because I can get a little bit um, off at a tangent occasionally. People have said that from time to time. So what we've got is Jesus has just literally got out of the temple where they were trying to stone him and he comes across a man who's been born blind. I love the fact that I don't get the image in my mind of Jesus running away. But his time hadn't yet come. But it's a stressful time. Don't forget Jesus was a man as well as God. Yeah? Holy man. It would have been, you know, his heart, I'm sure, would have been beaten fast. But he sees a need in front of him. And the wonderful thing about our Savior is this. He's never too busy to meet a need that's in front of him. Never. Now the disciples want to know, how did this man come to be blind? But it's interesting that Jesus isn't particularly interested in that. He will deal with the question. But he is more interested in being prepared to act when he sees a need. So... I do want to sort of tie in with a, a little bit of archaeology here. Because it's important, this is not an aside, this, is, this is, really is important stuff. But it's not far away from the pool of Siloam when this happens. Because if you remember, he makes the mud, puts it on the man's eyes, and then says, go to the pool of Siloam. Now, there's a long history of these locations being debated by especially liberal theologians, who used to say there's no evidence that this pool of Siloam existed anywhere. Now, Hezekiah's tunnel was discovered. Some of you have been in Hezekiah's tunnel. Anybody over here? Yep, I see those hands. It's nice to get hands raised in church. Isn't it? Um, anybody over here? Yep. Anybody in this block? You heathens, you've never been. Anybody over here? Yeah. So you can all picture Hezekiah's tunnel. If we put the first picture up, actually, you'll see the runs. Um, and, and basically what happened was that 600 years before Jesus, um, when the Assyrian army is about to um, surround and put siege to Jerusalem, Hezekiah knows that there is the Gihon Spring 
outside the city walls, where if he can divert it and bring it through a tunnel into the center of the city, the city could survive siege, which indeed it did. So this is a 1,750 foot tunnel under the city of David, uh, and it carries the water. Who's actually been in the tunnel? Some of you? Claustrophobic or not? I haven't been in Hezekiah's tunnel. I want to next time I go. I've been in a pyramid once where you go down in, you know, a long, a long walk. And what got me, is anybody get claustrophobic on these occasions? What overcome me was the thought that the only air I was breathing was the breath that had been expelled from the thousands of other people who were there before me. Put me off a wee bit. Now, at one point, the thought that this was the Pool of Siloam, if we put the next slide up, and it's, it's, it's a long-standing thing. It's, see, it's an old picture, and it's, been, um, it's at the end of Hezekiah's Tunnel, and you can see what it looks like today uh, on the next slide. Um, but in 2004, there was work going along uh, along a drainage pipe, and there was a large, they found a large stone step, and the archaeologist, uh, I think it was Ronnie Reich and uh, Eli Shuriken, uh, and, and they quickly revealed a series of steps leading down under the adjacent garden, and the garden belongs to the Greek Orthodox Church, and so it was very difficult to get permission to dig down there. The next photograph shows where the, um, the, the excavations were taking place on the west side of the city of David. And on the next one, you'll see where the thought on point A was the pool of Siloam. But then this discovery takes place. This is only 2004, right? This is not a long time ago. And point B shows the excavation. I've got some slides of the discovery actually being made, if we put them up. And, and you can see this big drainage pipe that, that runs there. And when they went in and they found the bottom of that, they found this um, diversion from the Gihon Spring. And, and you can see how it runs. And then they start digging back from the steps. And then they started to be able to see the structure that they're unearthing. It's a little bit bigger than what they thought it was, isn't it? Yeah, uh, And then they dug further down, and then from another angle you see it perhaps better, uh, and, and then you'll see it from an, an, a last one that comes up. And so they've got now a reconstruction of what it looks like. Do you, do you want to see what the Pool of Siloam looked like? That would have been it. And that's the steps going down. And it is actually what's called a mikveh. And a mikvah is a ritual cleansing um, so that you could walk through uh, with your and, and, and become ritually clean before you go to the temple. So it was a ritual bath, a place of cleansing, sent, the sent ones. You'd be sent there to be ritually clean before you went to the temple. Thanks, guys, for that. So what you have is that before the Gihon hits the pool of Siloam, you have the source for the drinking water, because you want to have the drinking water out before people have mucky baths. Yeah? But then you have the pool of Siloam, where people can go through and become clean. And because the water is living water and flows away, that's why the pool of Siloam was so important. And this is where they took the golden ewer, to use for this water libation on the great day of the feast. This was where the living water was being poured out. Let's get back to the miracle. It's going to tie in with this pool of Siloam, but let's go back to it for a second. I keep asking myself, why mud and spit? And then I start thinking. Now this is just me musing for a second. I try to picture this man's face. 
And I don't know. Athena was arguing with me in the car. She might be right and I might be wrong. We know the man was blind. But I don't know whether he had eyes. I don't know. But he's blind from birth. But something struck me. Why dirt and spit? How did God create Adam? From the dust of the earth. And suddenly I got excited. I'm going to give you some other reasons why he might have done it. I'm sure he reasons why he did it. But suddenly I get this feeling in my heart that our great Lord and Creator who was before the world began, as John said, he was with God and was God. And when Adam was created from the dust, what we're seeing here is that extension of this creative power of Christ. Suddenly, I'm not put off by spit and dust. I'm excited by it. Because now God takes the commonest stuff and there's a creative act and suddenly the mud is put on the face of the man. Go and wash. Go and wash. And so he goes. But you know, there's other reasons too why Jesus did this. Don't forget, and this is what I said at the beginning, the context is highly important. He's in a tussle with the Pharisees. He's shown the Pharisees for who they are. And you've got to remember at the time, the, the, the people of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees, created constantly new laws. That was their bag. That was, if you want to know what it was like to be Jewish under the law, that was how they did things. So, for example, I've used this illustration before, but it'll stand. Let's say the, the Bible says, do no work on the Sabbath. Okay, that's fine. The Bible says that. So they create a new law. And they put a line in the sand and they say, but let, let's put that new law there. Because if you don't cross that line, you can't break this line. Does that make sense? The, the temperance movement used to do it. The Bible says don't get drunk. Yeah? So they created a Pharisee type of law. I understand the social conditions, so please don't, let's not go into a bait on this, but let's just use it as a case. They put a line that said, don't touch alcohol. Because they said, if you don't touch alcohol, you can't get drunk. Do you understand? So they created a new law. Don't touch drink. And Jesus condemned that idea. That's what the Pharisees did. So, for example, and I can quote you, because a wonderful guy called Alfred Edisham, if you've ever read his books, Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, puts an annex in it. And in that annex, he puts down some of the ways that these Pharisaic laws were put down. So, for example, it was an outright prohibition against healing, except if a person's life was in danger on the Sabbath. You've got to wait until the next day, then you can heal them. But you can't heal anybody on the Sabbath. Jesus constantly did it. Yes? Why? Because he's breaking with the Pharisaic tradition and telling them that they are blind. So since blindness was not life-threatening, the healing could wait for the next day. And that's in Tractate Shabbat 108.2. Next, to inject any substance into a person's eye was considered an act of healing and expressly forbidden on the Sabbath. And that's in Tractate Shabbat 108.2. So Jesus is deliberately doing this miracle in a way that reveals him as creator. 
But he's also doing it in a way that breaks the Pharisaic scribal tradition. Jesus wanted nothing to do with that version of Jewishness. Do you understand? Deliberately going against that. By healing this man, he's not only restoring his sight, but he's simultaneously demonstrating the blindness of the Pharisees. Deliberately doing this great work of God in a way that offended all of their rules. And Israel would be divided on this line, man-made religion versus the word of God. And the man is sent to the pool of Silo. Come with me just a little bit on this journey. The great day of the feast has happened, but we're still during the end of this feast of tabernacles. The pool of Siloam would not be empty. You've seen the size of it. It would have been thronged with people. And here we've got this beggar, presumably being helped by his friends, walking towards the pool with mud on his face and mud in his eye. There's mud in your eye for you. Funny enough, that expression apparently comes back to this. I didn't realize that. I wonder how many people witnessed this stumbling man coming to the steps. He would have fallen in. He's blind since birth. He would have had to have been helped down to the water's edge. I don't know whether he knelt on the side or whether he plodged right in. Plodge is another Merton word. But the water, the water washes away the mud. What it must be like to see for the very first time. The only way he knew what a human face looked like was to put his fingers upon the face I'm sure he did of his mother and his father, maybe brothers and sisters, maybe somebody who loved him especially. And the only way he knew what they were like was to see with his fingertips. But now, but now he sees. I was blind, but now I see. To see the light reflected on the water. To see the beauty of water itself. To see trees. To see the city walls. To see the sky. He might have felt the sun on his face where he'd never seen it before. Now notice. I don't think it's an unreasonable thing to assume. Did he do this in silence? Did he go, oh, that's nice. I'm sure he was extremely vocal, shouting his head off, I can see! Wow! That's what you look like. Who would have thought it? Blind from birth, amazed at everything that he sees. Now, as, as much as the Pharisees might have wanted not to pick up on this, they had no choice. Because I'm sure everybody around the pool of Siloam was going, hey, have you seen this guy? He was blind. We've seen him. Look, look, it's him. Because it says in the reading that some people are going, hey, hey, this guy can see. Another saying, well, looks like him, but it can't be because he can see. Isn't it interesting the way the public are divided? So the Pharisees bring him in. I won't go through all that again, but they just keep asking them the same questions. They're like the police, aren't they? You know, explain what you were doing in the street at 10 o'clock at night with that black bag around your back. I'm talking about you. Yeah. 
Okay, lastly, what can we learn from this story? One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. The first thing that struck me about it actually was, it wasn't for the want of light. The light was all around him, but he couldn't see it. He was blind. His optic nerves were dead, if there were optic nerves. His eyes, if they were there, had nothing. Friends, we're described in Scripture as being blind ourselves. All of us. In our natural birth, we are blind to the things of God. God is all around us. But we didn't see it. His love is all around us. We might have had a sample of the sunlight on our face. Some vague sense of the warmth of God around about us. But we couldn't see it for ourselves. What a total change. When we were blind but now we see. We were blind without God. But Christ comes and dies for us. Is resurrected and offers us new life. And suddenly when he says you must be born again, it makes sense because we must be born again in the spirit of God. Friends, it's not only a new birth, it's like having your eyes opened. John Newton, wasn't it? He was a slave captain of a ship. Ran profit out of human traffic. Didn't get there it was wrong. Until God touched his heart. And he turned around and says, I was blind. But now I see. And became a leading light in the abolitionist movement with Wilberforce and the other Christians who fought slavery in this country. And penned the words, of, unless I'm mistaken, is that right? He's a specialist on him. Amazing grace. A slave captain who realized he'd been blind all his life. But when he met Christ, he could see. I'm, I'm going to give you a, a hint here. Something really important in your witness. It's a weapon. And it's a weapon that you can take up with confidence. And when you get in debate with anybody, stand on this. Somebody might be more intelligent than you. They might be more persuasive speakers. They might be far more eloquent than you could ever be. But if you start off from where you were with your experience... And you can stand and say, I was blind, but now I see. There isn't anybody who can argue against you. The Pharisees of this world might stand up and say, well, tell us again. I don't believe you. But all you've got to say is, I know this to be true because I was blind, but now I see. And you can have confidence that if you were able to say that, then nobody can argue against you. And I want to challenge you this week to stand on your personal experience of being blind but suddenly being able to see. And tell it to your friends. Tell them to anybody who will listen. I was blind but now I see. It's the power of a personal story. And it cannot be over come. Yes? But you know, the argument is stronger still. 
because this man can stand up and say, I was blind, but now I see. But there were others. And they could turn around and say, yeah, he was blind. But now he can see. He was. I know him. In fact, his mom and dad are hauled out. Yeah? Is this your lad? Oh, hi, yeah. Was he blind? Well, of course he was. He's blind since birth. Everybody knows it. I'm sure it doesn't just look like him. No, I know it doesn't just look like him. It's him. You know, there are people here this morning in their old guise were people you might not want to meet. In their old guise, in their old self, you don't mind me picking on you, Paul? <laughs> Drug dealer, fighter. Now, trophy of grace in God. We've got a church with people who were homeless and living in drugs. <laughs> living in drugs. That's probably true, actually. <laughs> Drug ridden lives transformed by the power of God. People who were once alcoholics set free. My own family. My great grandfather, I never met him, he's dead before I was born. But they used to tell me the story over and over. My grandmother, Eva Hughes, who now a, was a preacher, her father was a wife beater and a drunk. A brutal and hard man. And every time he came home drunk, he beat his wife. It was getting worse. And it was getting worse. And she knew she didn't have long to live. He came home in the most furious rage, drunk as a skunk. She could hear him picking up what he used to beat her from the table downstairs. And he was walking upstairs to the bedroom. And she cried out to Christ. God, save him. Not save me. She wasn't interested in her personal safety. She didn't want the sin of murder laid on his heart and his life. He climbed the stairs, never made it to the top. Before Christ struck him down. And he wept. And crawled into the bedroom, asked for forgiveness, wept his way to Christ, and she led him to Christ. Amen. You ask his friends, he was blind, now he sees. He suddenly became a pillar of the church. It's not just the fact that you yourself were blind and can see and you know it. It's the fact that others can see the transformation in your life all around in everything that you do. That's who we are, folks, as people. That's who we need to be utterly transformed and made over by the power of God. And as I look around, I can see many whose personal stories I know. I was blind. Now I see it's a personal, a personal argument. But it's not just that. Because others witnessed it too. Sorry. Ringleaders in the army of Satan. Now ringleaders in the army of Christ. Amen. If Christ hadn't changed my great-grandfather, I'd never have been born. Bless God. All I know. 
We only have to know Christ. This is a model of how to act. As I'm drawing to a close, I just want to bring together these last strands. He didn't get his eyesight and then find a good place to hide out the way. He didn't get his eyesight and think, where can I get out of all this debate, all these Pharisees attacking me? He stands up, prepared to be a witness to the truth. He can't defend himself other than falling back on what we've already said. I know it because it was happening to me. But he's prepared to stand up. He doesn't even have a full knowledge of who it is. Who was it who did this to you? Um, a prophet? He's guessing. He meets Jesus later and then acknowledges him as the Messiah. I will put my faith in you. When you put your faith in Christ, you don't become a shrinking violet and hide away. You don't lock yourself in the cupboard. Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before the Father. Friends, there's no such thing as secret disciples. There were secret disciples on the Sanhedrin, but the day came they had to nail their colors to the cross. We know of two of them, Nicodemus and Josephus. What did they do? They nailed their colors to the mast. They went to see Pilate. They said, give us the body of Jesus. They even took the body of Christ down from the cross themselves and cleaned the body and put it in Joseph's tomb. Friends, if you're a secret disciple, you come here, but none of your mates know that you're a disciple of Christ. You've been hiding too long. You've got to own up for what Christ has done for you. Take the decisive step. You know, I'm always, I'm always intrigued by the stories of people coming to Jesus. It's always exciting. Let me tell you this, because I think this is prophetic for somebody. You do not know if you were the last step in the chain. Somebody before you has preached Christ. Somebody before you has witnessed Somebody before you has planted seeds. And the Holy Spirit has been watering those seeds. And it's ready to come to harvest. You don't know whether the last thing that needs to happen is your witness of Christ. Picture a set of scales. Picture the weight on one side. But if you slowly put a grain of sand, one by one, or pour it out for you, because it'll take a long time if you just do them one at a time. Pour it out. But there'll come a point where the weight just seems to move slightly. And then you could virtually put the grains of sand on one at a time, and you will come to a point where suddenly everything shifts. The sand goes down and the weights go up because you've reached that critical point. This week, you might have the privilege of being that last grain of sand. You might be nothing special. You might not have great words to say. But your statement about you know because you are blind but now you see, and your personal story can shift the scales. And somebody can move from darkness to light. I'm saying this for people who are watching online in particular. Some can never admit that they are blind. <clears throat> they've never seen the light, so they've got no comprehension of what it could be. Some don't realize the state of their own heart. 
But if you are reflective, if you think carefully, you might understand that Facebook reveals your dark side and Twitter reveals the depth of your spite. Instagram perhaps reveals your pride and your search engine and Google reveals your secret heart. Some people don't know the blind, but when you meet Christ, everything changes. He wants to make you new. He wants you to surrender to him. He wants you to bring you into a completely new world. A world of change. Sadly, there are some who don't know the blind, and in particular the Pharisees. My prayer this morning is that we will all be changed. We will all stand upon our personal experience of Christ. That we will all share Christ with others. And we will praise Him and thank Him for everything that He has done for us. I was blind, but now we see.